Welcome to a Rejuvenate 2021. Um, today we have a very special panel with very, very interesting panelists. Uh, the featured panel title today is Why Does Plastic Waste End Up in the Ocean? And joining me today is YB Yobi In, Member of Parliament for Bakri, and also Julian Hyde, General Manager of Reef Check Malaysia. Uh, my name is Jishin Kumar. I would be the moderator for this webinar. Okay. Now, the goal of the session is we want to actually discuss the long-standing issue of plastic waste and um, we can share past efforts and ongoing ones from two different perspectives. One is from an NGO perspective and another one is from a policymaker perspective. Now, estimated 8 million tons of plastic waste escapes into the oceans from coastal nations around the world. Now, this uh, is a long-standing issue. So let's get on with it. But before we start, let's get to know our panelists a bit more uh, better. Julian, now, how did you end up in Malaysia and how did the association with Reef Check came about? Uh, Jishin, good afternoon. Uh, YB, good afternoon and, and to everybody listening. Um, I came here for a job. Uh, I came here in 1998, uh, a long time ago. Uh, to work for a UK-based environmental consulting company. Um, that job finished after two years, and instead of going back to the UK, I decided to stay, followed a dream, moved out to Pulau Tioman. I still can't say it right. Uh, where I lived for six okay. years. That's pretty okay, Pulau Tioman, yeah, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> right. Well, I lived on the island for six years running a dive centre, uh, and then, uh, which, which was just a dream. Um, got involved with ReCheck during that time, um, and then when I moved back to KL in 2007, I became more involved and it eventually ended up uh, heading the organization. So that's how that happened. So Reef Check uh, is from the United States, right? It was established in the US in about 1996, 97. But when we say that, it was basically uh, the methodology, which is called Reef Check, the Coral Reef Survey methodology, uh, was, was kicked off by an American uh, scientist. And mm -hmm. he set up Reef Check in the US. Uh, we've now got about chapters in about 90 countries around the world. So there's a reef check in Philippines, in Thailand, Indonesia, uh, Japan, and, and so on. We're the biggest uh, reef check organization in Southeast Asia. Wow. Okay. So let's, let me ask you, what do you think is the biggest problem with ocean waste in the country? And where do you even begin in terms of like how actually it's affecting the coral reef ecosystem? Yeah, well, <laughs> we've been asking that ourselves that question for several years now. There are impacts on coral reefs. Uh, plastics can re release toxins into the water. There's physical damage that plastic can cause as well, not to mention the fact that marine creatures eat the plastic, microplastics, and then we eat the marine creatures. So we're then eating the plastic as well. And all of those toxic impacts are passed on to us. There are endocrine inhibitors, inhibitors toxic cancer-causing chemicals. So all sorts of stuff can happen. So there are very good reasons for keeping this stuff out of the marine environment. But how you actually do that is difficult. We started looking at this because, when was it now, four years ago, I was on Pula Mantanani again, and the beach was covered in plastic again. And I'm like, I have to do something about this. Mm. So we started talking to some of the big brands. Um, and we started looking at where, what is the chain? How is, how is plastic arriving on the beach? Because it doesn't spontaneously get there. The local communities are too small to be generating that much plastic. It's coming from somewhere. And basically you go see uh, a river, you go back up the chain and you end up in the towns. Whether it's falling out of overfill rubbish bins on the side of the street, whether it's blowing off of landfills or illegal dumps, whether it's just not being segregated at source at households so that it can be made available for recycling, mm -hmm. whether it's littering, um, all of these reasons, plastic can end up in the environment, you know, bin, road, drain, river, ocean, beach. That's how it happens. So basically, it's city folk like us somewhere is, you know, we, we're just not collecting this properly. It's too much of it is leaking into the environment. Um, we've done some work on this ourselves and we think household segregation is one issue, but it's a complicated chain of events, as I know YB will, 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 will say. But... Um, we think there are some key points that we can intervene at, and one of them is making more of it available for recycling so that it doesn't even get out into the environment in the first place. Now, uh, how does this plastics waste in the ocean actually affect coral reef ecosystem? Um, well, like I said, uh, what you often see, too often see, is a plastic bag 
or a, a mesh bag caught on corals. So it stays and it pulls the coral. It smothers the coral so that this coral can't get sunlight anymore and corals need sunlight to survive. So you get physical damage like that. Uh, broken coral by, by, by bottles and things that get wedged in coral, the, the coral can break and that's a point where disease can enter. And so that also leads to coral dying. Um, and the chemicals themselves from the, from the, from the plastics as well, if they're, if they're in contact with a piece of coral, then you, get, you can get leakage from the plastic into the coral itself. The, the coral itself is the building backbone of the coral reef. And mm -hmm. so if that physical structure starts to break down, then the whole of the reef's ecosystem services over a period of time will be, will be lost. It's like the trees in a forest, right? Mm -hmm. Corals are the structure of the coral reef itself. Okay, thank you, Julian. YB, um, I don't need to ask anybody or uh, anyone to, to, to introduce you. I don't need to ask you to introduce yourself. You are very famous in Malaysia. Um, as the former Minister of Energy, Technology, Science, Environment and Climate Change, which is an amazing portfolio, by the way, where do you think uh, this current fight against plastic dumping is? Um, I, I think uh, it, it is still as challenging as when I was uh, I, I think we need to differentiate between plastic import and plastic dumping. It's actually a totally different thing. Plastic import means we actually have more than our our, our rubbish because we import more rubbish. Sure. Uh, dumping is um, is that how we mismanage the, uh, the waste. Like what Julian said, actually not all plastic waste will end up in the ocean. So they go through the, they, they go to the ocean through two things. One is leakages. Leakages is that, say for example, if you have dumped it into the dump site, some of them will end up into the river and then go into the water body. And then the second one is uncollected waste. That means uh, if you throw into like roadside or whatever, that is not collected. Um, so those are the two things, uncollected waste plus a leakages uh, from the system. Uh, from a collection system. So for example, a country like Singapore, they do use a lot of single-use plastics, but do they end up in ocean? Uh, it is very unlikely because their collection rate is near to 100 and their, their waste are all uh, going into the uh, incineration plant. So they don't end up in ocean. Um, so, so that is one thing. And, uh, and the second question you asked me, what was that again? Um, what, what do you think the current fight against yeah. Plus, yeah. Okay, so we still have the same problem on mismanagement of plastic collection mm. uh, because uh, of the, 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 the fact that a lot of our plastic, uh, a lot of our dump sites are actually unsanitary like dump site. Uh, more than 90% are, are not sanitary uh, dump site. That means actually if you today, if you throw rubbish in your house, it will just end up in a bigger dump site. It's a dump, it's a site where it is a big piece of land. They will just dump the, uh, the, the, the rubbish from one layer to one layer and one layer, one layer, then they cover with soil, another layer cover with soil, and then it makes like a hill of the dump site. It's called a dump site. Huh? So mm -hmm. nearly 90% uh, of uh, Malaysia uh, waste management, uh, waste disposal system, it is still a dump site and there is no improvement um, yet. Um, so the other thing is uh, plastic import. Do we have a see, a see improvement of plastic import? Actually, I see there is a lot of improvement uh, mm -hmm. because when we faced plastic import a problem in 2018, uh, we sent back the plastic waste, but we do not only send back the plastic waste, we also do two things. One is that we institutionalize the action, institutionalize procedures. So, so now all the customs, all the relevant agencies, uh, they will have to follow certain procedures in, term, in, in terms of custom, the solid waste management department, the DOE, what do you do when you actually uh, see uh, uh, an illegal plastic uh, import? What do you do? Uh, so, so what are the procedures? We actually write them into an SOP. So now it's actually easy. Uh, it's a more clean everyone knows what they do. So when we face a problem, no one knows what to do. So we actually have to start from scratch, but we do not only do it, we, we actually document it and then mm. we launch it. And then all the, so now all the agencies will know. The second thing that we did was uh, international convention. Actually, it's not that we propose it. Norway proposed it for the Basel Convention Amendment. Basel Convention uh, is 
it's a convention uh, that controls transboundary movement of hazardous waste. Uh, that means it's not only for plastic waste. Plastic waste used to be categorized as uh, uh, category two, annex two. That means it's not controlled by Basel Convention because it's always uh, deemed as a domestic waste. Um, but uh, Norway has suggested an amendment of which Malaysia support very strongly because we became a victim of plastic import in uh, 2018 or uh, 2019 Basel Convention uh, mm -hmm. uh, called Conference of Party, where we do uh, plastic become an annex two, but we will categorize them only homogeneous, ready recy recyclable plastic in Annex 2, that means you do not need prior informed consent. Mm -hmm. But the other plastics will go into, uh, uh, no, Annex 9. So it initially was Annex 9. Then uh, now we split them into three categories. Annex 9, homogeneous, non-recyclable. Annex 2 is the plastic which is ready to be processed and mm -hmm. to be recycled, but it can be, uh, it can, it, it is, it is non-contaminated, uh, non but this needs to be prior informed consent. And the other one is even worse. That is a plastic that is contaminated with hazardous waste. It will be in Annex 8. So mm. if you cannot remember any of this, just remember there is a Basel Convention change. Uh, there is an international uh, convention change where we will now be able to categorize plastic more uh, uh, better in terms of how do we control transboundary movement. Of plastic. Mm. Actually, it's the biggest scam. Uh, plastic recycling in the developed world is actually the biggest scam uh, of, uh, as of as of 2018, it was the biggest scam uh, of uh, recycling. Uh, <laughs> but, but now it's a better one because through better convention, uh, through more awareness uh, uh, and people get to see how when you say you move your plastic out from your country, it is not mm -hmm. the recycle but dump in uh, the developing world and the least developed world. So, mm -hmm. so this is the uh, two things that we do. So I do believe that um, as of now, the plastic import, at least we, are, we have institutionalized the system, but I think there are still many things to be improved, but I think that fight is okay. Uh, as in, we just need to continue to refine what else we should do. But the other thing, that the, the, the management of waste, we still have huge problem. Just now before the forum, I told you about how yeah, yeah. it is very difficult for me as an environment minister to have to control plastic waste because plastic waste or waste itself is under local government ministry. And plus actually plastic import, the approval, the AP, is actually given by local government ministry. So a lot of people ask you, always ask me uh, when I was in my minister, why do you want to allow for import? You should ask right now, not ask me, you know. So you will have a problem between two ministers and then, and then, uh, so, so overall, because environment ministry and solid waste management is not under one ministry, it becomes very, very difficult uh, mm -hmm. for, for management of reduce, reuse, recycle of of, of waste as a general, not only plastic waste, but as general, it is difficult because they are split into two ministry. And uh, when it comes to two ministry, a coalition a politics, you may end up with the ministers at, from different parties and then they they may be even more difficult, even the same party also difficult to talk and then da, 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 da. So you have all these problems. So one of the things that I feel that is most important, I feel very, very strongly about is environmental governance needs to be under one ministry. Environment ministry must have brown issues, green issues, solid waste management, uh, everything under one, then we can control the environment better. So I really hope the new government after G15 uh, will be able to have the courage to do this. Then later on, we will, we will be able to solve our, most of this problem quite easily. Uh, through through this restructuring. Okay. Uh, thank you. It's easier yeah. than what we have today. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Why we uh, thank you so much. Let's uh, we will talk a bit more why we about um, your single use plastic campaign later. But let me just talk to Julian first. Julian, uh, maybe you can just share with us a bit more about Reef Check's efforts in Malaysia since two thousand seven, and perhaps uh, some milestones, milestones, and some ongoing work. So um, we've been doing an annual survey program since 2007. Uh, we now cover 
uh, 200 sites around Malaysia. So we go back to the same place every year and we can therefore compare year on year uh, what's happening. We look at the amount of live coral cover, uh, we look at the amount of trash on the reef, you know, is that is that increasing? And those changes in the indicators help us to track the health of coral reefs and what's changing, what's going wrong, so we can do something about them. Uh, we've slowly evolved through education programs and advocacy into um, an organization that works on trying to strengthen management. You talk about uh, management of waste, YB. Well, you know, we have issues with management of other assets, uh, forests, you know, eco ecosystems in general. Um, and so we're trying to work with local stakeholders to, to get them to participate in management, to get them to take some ownership of what's happening. Um, you know, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that people who are involved and who are engaged, you have less compliance issues, you have more, you know, more, more participation um, in, in, in the system, in, in looking after systems than people who are just told what to do by government. Um, we've somehow got involved in waste management. As a, as a marine NGO, we now run the waste management system on Pulam Antonani. Oh. Why? Because nobody else was doing it. Uh, the locals were using the ocean as their dumping ground. So at the end of every day, somebody would come down from the household with a little wooden sled, throw the trash into the, into the ocean on the side of the beach, and walk away. Some of it would float away on the tide, some of it would be eaten by the cows, some of it would come back on the next tide, but this, you know, you, you, that's how part of how you end up with messy beaches. So we try to, we are now encouraging people to segregate waste. Uh, we are now collecting all recyclables. We sell the plastic, which of course you make a bit of money. It's still not economical because it costs us too much in transport costs. But we're now running the waste management on that island. Similarly on Pulatium, and we're doing a similar sort of thing where we've established plastic recycling. Why did we do this? Because if you want local communities to listen to your issues, first of all, you have to listen to their issues. So we can go to Mantanani and say, oh, we've got to look after those coral reefs. This, this is something we've learned through the years. And they're like, no, first let's talk about the fact we need a clinic mm -hmm. and water supply and power supply and sewage treatment and transportation to the mainland and all of those things that they've been looking forward to getting for several years. So if we come in and say, no, no, coral reefs first. They're like, no, no. We have a generator that works from 12, from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. sometimes. Uh, that's a more important problem for us. Mm. So what what we have evolved into is this organization that kind of works on those community issues. So we're working on economic development things now. So again, on Mantanani, we've created three new little employment opportunities for the locals because there's no tourism anymore. You know, it just disappeared 15 months ago. Okay. Uh, and if you look at when we're now predicting uh, the economy to recover. Tourism isn't coming back till next March. So there has been zero tourism in this country for two years. All of those tourism enterprises have been terribly badly affected. We've just delivered, we've just agreed a, a program with a, with a sponsor to deliver 200,000 ringgit worth of food around several islands in Malaysia because there are people that are really hurting out there. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So you kind of, you know, you go with where the, the, the issues are taking you. So. Hence, a marine and conservation organization then ends up in waste management and economic development. I don't know how we got there. But uh, yeah. have you, has there been good support from local government, council, or, or corporates and things like that? Corporates, yes. Most of our funding comes from corporations. So we were at Yais and Darby, Yais and Sain Darby, Yais and Hazana. We're doing the project in Messing with MISC. Um, but a cooperation with government is, is patchy. Uh, we do work with DOF, uh, who, who administratively owned the Marine Parks, previously was Marine Parks Department, so we do work with them. Uh, but government has a very different way of doing things, and so there's a lot of negotiation. I was going to say conflict, but I don't want to say conflict. A lot negotiation, of negotiation yeah. to understand different points of views and different ways of doing things. We want to uh, encourage local stakeholders to have a stronger role. Government is saying, no, this is a government function, we will do it. So that's been going on backwards and forwards now for about six or seven years as we mm. try, try to work a better way around that. Uh, at local level, we haven't had that much involvement, but we are working with uh, Majlista Era Mersing now on the project in uh, Johor. And so mm -hmm. that's relating us to Johor state government. I'd love to do more at, at state government level uh, because on the ground is where the conservation happens, not not in, in, the, in Putrajaya, not in KL. Correct. Um, so, yeah, we have a fair degree of cooperation uh, on the ground. Yeah. All right. 
Thanks, Julian. Um, YB, talking about local governments and, and talking about governments, YB, let's look at your, let's talk about your Let's Break Up uh, Single Plastic Use campaign, where you actually kind of declared war against nations that uh, made Malaysia a plastic dumping ground. Things like that you know, happened a few years ago, but people are still talking about it. Walk us through the whole campaign and what actually did you have to do and the challenges you faced? Yeah, okay. so um, actually, but um, the war against the plastic import is one single-use plastic campaign is another. Single-use plastics campaign is actually for uh, local plastic use. Um, so whenever we talk about uh, three R's, before we talk about recycling, we always have to remember it is reduce, reuse, recycle. So we always have to start with reduce, right? So how do we reduce the use of single-use plastic? So we actually came up with a roadmap uh, that is very simple, that by 2030, uh, we will go to a, a, a time where we will, our aim is zero single-use plastic. So how do we define that we will not use uh, uh, single-use plastic anymore because I think eventually everything will still be under single-use. Uh, there was still something that needs to be single-use. Right. So our plan was initially to get the top 10 single-use plastics that is used in Malaysia and then to be able to say okay by 2030 we will either make sure we don't use uh, or have an alternative that is more environmental friendly or that we, they are into a secular economy uh, a secular economy um, uh, system where you have a very little or minimal uh, minimal uh, disposal of single-use plastic of the top 10 use of plastic. We were not able to came up with the top 10 yet before I left the office because unfortunately I left the office much earlier than we expected. Mm -hmm. So we were actually embarking on the research to find out the top 10. Uh, we already almost get funding. So anyway, uh, but what we have done uh, uh, during the, the tenure is this, is that we want to say that uh, at least this plastic bag, plastic bag that we use every day, shopping bags, are one of the one of the most used in the used plastics uh, in, mm. in, 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 in Malaysia. So we want to say, can we uh, start making it not free? Because a long time, many people will think that you know, plastic bag is a packaging that that should come free, but the, yeah. actually, although the production is free, like almost free because it's very cheap, it's yeah. a chemical products, that's very cheap, but the disposal is actually not. Uh, mm. Many people do not know uh, if we collect the plastic, especially in Malaysia, we collect the or we collect all our rubbish and we dump it into the dump site, and it will take about a few hundred years for these plastics to actually. <laughs> To actually um, decompose. Uh, yeah. This is a cost that is not counted in the cost of production. And we want to say that to people recognize it. Can people say, okay, now if I go to a shopping mall, I at least I'm willing to pay for the 20 cent. And that 20 cent is a minimum. So uh, Penang is going into 50 cent already or a ringgit. But we want to say, okay, throughout Malaysia, can we in three years' time, because different uh, states will have. Uh, very different. It, it's up to their uh, state government because we actually talk to the state government and say, do you want to be a part of it? And all the state governments, whether they are Parikatan, uh, the Pakatan Harapan or Baris, Barisan National, then all agree to say, okay, in three years time, we will at least commit to, uh, to, to put a price into plastic in big retail. That means if you shop in Giant, uh, Maidi, you know, all this, uh, in the retail chain, at least to, for people to start recognizing that uh, plastics is not free, I should mm. use reusable plastic uh, more, I should bring my, my own plastic bag back to, to shopping and all that. So it went uh, quite well. Uh, most Many of the states are already start doing it, whether it, it go across the political house. I, 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 I think this, this thing actually, uh, it is not quite political. I mean, most mm -hmm. of the people support it. It's just people say, okay, give me time mm -hmm. because I don't have machinery. So what do the, so we also tell the state government uh, what to do uh, with the 20 cents because the 20 cents, the federal government do not take it. So the mm -hmm. state government's collecting the money. What do they do? They have to plow into that, into green initiatives 
in the local level. That means they have to give money to, let's say, for example, raising awareness on plastic or raising awareness on green and everything. So everything that you collected from the, from the plastic that you charge uh, from the retail, there must be a system. So and then give all the states uh, the, the system that they need to uh, see that system and to be able to say, okay, we have, we have collected this amount of money and this amount of money needs to be on certain certain things and it cannot be used for other purposes. It has to be on environmental purposes so that everyone who pay know that, okay, this I'm paying to protect the environment and I'm not paying to just for state government to actually be, be uh, to, 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 to have waste. And the other part of it that we have started Unfortunately, because we go according to the to the to the key uh, milestone is the, in the roadmap was circular economy roadmap that we mm -hmm. started. Actually, we actually started Malaysian plastic pack. Malaysian plastic pack is a a a, a pack where actually we involve uh private uh that produces a lot of plastics. Uh, for example, um people that use a lot of packaging uh for Coca Cola, you know, food and beverages uh, uh, companies, big companies to be a part of it so that they are involved in circular economy roadmap and they themselves support the financing, all that for, for, for Malaysian Plastic Pack. Unfortunately, we also wasn't able to see it coming because we're supposed to launch circular economy roadmap end of 2020, but uh, because of COVID and also because of the change of government, we were not able to do that. But I will pursue that in Parliament to ask when is the circular economy roadmap going to be done. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other part that we also have uh, was, was doing in, uh, uh, in this uh, roadmap was the uh, uh, how do we have more uh, uh, communication, say far, we call it communication, education and public awareness. Um, of course, again, it is very tricky. Uh, recycling, you remember, is actually under local government. So it was very tricky. But what we could do then was that why not we do a big picture public awareness campaign. So so one of the main things that I think uh, the other things we still do like we do in school la, programs la, this and that. But the and other part, when I was in school we uh, still used to yeah. do it right yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so those things I don't want to say la. we have to do it as business as usual. The, the one thing that I think that um, that uh, I think we should do more is a uh, true uh, TVs. So uh, at end of 2018, I went to the UK and then uh, among many environmental initiatives and energy initiatives that deal with the UK government, one of the things that I asked boldly was that, can we get a free viewership of a copyright of this David Edinburgh uh, uh, documentary to be published on our national TV, like mm. RTF1? Because a lot of people, if you have Netflix, you have Astro, you don't, you don't need that, right? You can still watch David Edinburgh. David Edinburgh has a very good series on environment, on ocean. So I wanted that series of, uh, of that. And so I asked whether they can give us a free uh, copyright for that. And uh, uh, very good, uh, the, the UK government actually allowed us to do it twice. Uh, mm -hmm. There are a few episodes, I think eight episodes. They allow us not to only air in RTM once, they allow us to air in RTM twice. Uh, I think I feel that this kind of sepa is important because people, you don't educate people. You don't say, you know, you must do this, do this, do this, uh, because what, what, what. you let people see how good the environment is, you know, mm. how beautiful the ocean is. And then the last episode was uh, David and Deborah then say the plastics make it not good anymore. So, mm. so then you, you know, you, you then think, oh, I wanted to. So I really hope that, um, of course, I really hope eventually Environment Ministry and uh, Solid Waste Management will be one. But if you are going to do SEPA, we must be doing SEPA in, uh, of course, a traditional way, teacher must teach, must teach and all that. But we also must think through, like, how do we, like, inspire people to do more for, for the environment. It is not through forcing and teaching. It is inspiration, right? Like, so this is one of it uh, that I thought that uh, we can do more and we can think of more ideas in times to come. So, okay. so, so those are some of the things, but you know, I, I will talk very long. <laughs> no, it's okay. Come back to you. <laughs> it's okay, Wybie. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, I just wanted to uh, ask uh, YB just a very quick, quick uh Question yeah, and a quick yeah, answer. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Short answer. Um, like, what would you want to change or tackle? The first thing that comes in your in your mind, 
uh, about uh, plastic wastage, if you would come back into power, let's say tomorrow, what would be the first thing? Plastic mismanagement or wastage? Wastage. I, okay, if you ask me the, what would be the priority to, to make the oceans less polluted with plastic, it's definitely not wastage. Management. It is plastic management. Okay. Why? Because, um, because if we need to understand the plastic waste eventually in the ocean is not because that you use a lot of plastic. Right. It's because your plastic uh, disposal is mismanaged. Of course, you also need to reduce your plastic, but first you need to stop the leakaging into the, the leakage into that. So if I even go back to power tomorrow, and if everything is possible, I hope uh, I will, uh, we will be able to have the environment ministry together with the uh, together with the natural resources ministry, so that Marine Park as well we discussed the. Uh, uh, with Julian just now, so that Marine Park will be under uh, Environment Ministry and Conservation all under Environment Ministry and then Solid Waste Management under Environment Ministry. Uh, that is my hope. So if tomorrow in power and, uh, and that I can influence the Prime Minister so much, I will ask him to, uh, to reshuffle the <laughs> Environment Ministry, which okay. is not possible. Both are not possible. Both tomorrow we will not be in power and second is that I won't be able to influence the Prime Minister. <laughs> So, okay, we can hope, YB. We can hope. Monday. Yeah, yeah, Monday. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, YB. Uh, Julian, there's a question from one of our viewers. Um, uh, Vin Ni Eng. Uh, he says, tell us a little more about Kebun community on Mantanani Island. You can answer, Julian? Yeah. Um, it's one of the initiatives supported by Yais and Hasana as part of the Economic Recovery Programme. Uh, that they implemented last year in response to COVID. Uh, we tried to, we, we helped the locals to establish three, try to establish three new businesses. One was in uh, abalone uh, production, which didn't work out for a variety of technical reasons. One was in virgin coconut oil production, which is still going. And one was in small scale agriculture on the island so that the local community could grow its own food instead of having to get it from the mainland all the time. Uh, that one is also still still going. So we had a group of a team of 10 people uh, who have just started harvesting. What did they do most recently? Watermelons uh, oh, wow. is, the, is the most recent thing. They've, they've harvested corn already. They're now on watermelons. So they, they're growing various crops, uh, green vegetables as well. Uh, and we are hoping to spin that out so that we get some families actually growing crops at household level rather than doing it in a, you know, in a, in a field where we've got fenced off Hopefully, more people will start to do it at household level as well. It's just to, it's looking at food security. Mm -hmm. um, it's looking at alternative livelihoods and incomes, supplementary incomes, because, like I said, tourism stopped, right? Yeah. And you know, you live in a place like that, you're going to be pretty reliant on uh, on tourism for your income. So, what do you do when they don't come anymore? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's it's uh, supplementary livelihoods basically. Okay, thanks, Julian. Uh, we have a few questions actually from the viewers, but uh, mostly to why we. Um, but uh, I think YB already answered the questions earlier. So I think there's one more for Julian. Esan Wahab asks, uh, how much does it cost to operate reef check in a year? An estimate maybe, Julian? Um, about a million ringgit. Um, is for all the three project sites? For the, the annual survey program, mm -hmm. uh, for the three sites that we have. Um, yeah, and, and other, other programs that are ongoing, but th those are the main ones. 70% um, of that is the cost of people. Um, our admin costs are about 7, 8% of the, of the total. So th things like, you know, accounts and, and, and all of that sort of stuff that's unavoidable. Mm -hmm. It's only about 7 or 8% of our expenses. The rest of it, 92% of uh, our funding goes on actual programs on the ground. Okay, all right. We actually have a lot of... Can yes. I just refer back to something that uh, YB spoke about, just, sure. just for a moment? Um, because we were also involved in the, in the Malaysia Plastics Pact, as it was originally called. So um, that has actually now gone ahead as the Malaysian Sustainable Plastics Association. Uh, they are slowly making progress towards this roadmap um, and, and things like identifying those single-use plastics that, uh, that YB mentioned. Bits of plastic that we really, we really do not need in our lives, okay? Stop using them. That's what the UK did with its uh, 
plastics packed and, and that was the sort of philosophy that was taken on here as well. Also to improve the amount, the proportion of, of packaging that is recyclable. So instead of selling me a product in packaging that I can't recycle, right. stop it mm. and make it recyclable packaging, right? Um, and then we've got uh, then we've got Maria, which is the industry response, which is the 10 Bing brands. YB mentioned Coca-Cola, you've got Unilever, Procter & Gamble, the other big players who are now going to establish a scheme whereby they can subsidize the cost of recovering plastic. Because right now, for example, on Pula Mantanani, I, I bring the plastics back from the island and I sell them in KK and I get 20 cents a kilo, right? And I bring 500 kilograms at a time. So I get a hundred ringgit. Wow. Mm. The boat rental is 900 ringgit, right? The <laughs> lorry rental from the mainland to KK is 130 ringgit. So every time I take plastics off the island, it costs me a thousand ringgit, right? Why am I still doing it? Mm. Because we believe it needs to be done because yeah. this is a tourist island. These are important marine ecosystems. You know, that, that's why we're going to go. Anyway, so hopefully before too long, our friends at Maria will be approaching us and saying, how can we make your life more easily to subsidize the cost of transport, for example? So, so those are initiatives which YB started off, credit where credit's due, they are still ongoing. It's been a slow process. It's been a, a long and slow gestation, but it's coming to fruition now, which, which is a great thing. Uh, not many of our competitive countries in Southeast Asia have got this far. Mm. And if you take that one step further and say not far, not many of our competitive tourism markets have got that far. So you now start to, to, to move this from being an economic cost into an economic opportunity because our beaches are cleaner because we've got better recycling. So you, yes, plastic is a cost, why have you already said that? And it's often ignored as a cost, but the consequences and the, and the downside of having plastic all over the place is a different type of cost. So you make an investment in improving waste management, you've improved your tourism products. For example, you're now looking after those ecosystems and you're not allowing them to be damaged by plastics. That's an investment in food security uh, mm -hmm. and job security for tour guides who take people snorkeling and diving. So. Um, some good stuff happening. A lot of problems we've still got to solve. Don't get me wrong. You know, there's a lot of work to be done, but right. there's a couple of institutions now that have started working recently that can push that agenda forward. Okay. Thank you, Julian. Uh, the next question uh, is to both of the panelists. Um, but I think YB talked about um, uh, how do you get, uh, the question is actually, how do you get more youths involved in the cause of reducing uh, plastics into the, in the ocean. Um, but I think YB answered it just now. Julian, what, what are your thoughts on that? How do you get more youths involved? Um, there are two good programs that, are, that I know of. One is called Trash Hero, and they have an ever-increasing number of uh, what's the word? branches around the country uh, where they do local-scale beach cleanups. Now, when we looked, started working on this three years ago, we said no more beach cleanups in 10 years because doing the same thing time after time and expecting a different result is Einstein's definition of insanity. Indeed, yeah. So we've got to move away from this eventually. So the, in, the, the initiatives that YB is put in place, the institutions that are coming up will hopefully resolve this. But at the moment, one thing you can do is get involved in beach cleanups. Reach Out Malaysia runs the International Coastal Cleanup, which is a nat nationwide thing. Uh, last year we had 5,000 people participate, but there was COVID. The year before it was something like 14,000. All around Malaysia, 80, 90 locations, uh, third weekend of September and everybody gets involved. Those are good ways to pull people in and get them a little bit more aware. But I think I agree with YB, we've got to have more education and public awareness programs to say, stop littering. You don't need that plastic bag. Even though my supermarket has stopped giving away plastic bags completely, not even for 20 cents, right? they still have plastic bags on the produce section. So you see people going, they've got two bananas in this bag and they've got a potato in this bag and they've got two tomatoes in this bag. So even though we've stopped giving away shopping bags, carrier bags, we're still giving away a lot of plastic to put right. the produce in. And there's another level of education required there. Uh, I'm not gonna preach any more than that, but uh, yeah, it, 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 people like, uh, get some some of Malaysia's celebrities involved, get them around a campaign to draw child, kid, kid, kids, to get, get youth together to, to start investigating some of these issues and understand the real impacts on society. Okay, uh, YB, um, talking about... Uh, yeah, I want to add a little bit on what you can sure. do. Actually, a lot of people uh, underestimated uh, uh, your influence in a, in a political decision. Um, 
actually, I think what you can do right now is to register to vote and then to tell the people that are going for an election that you need to have an environmental agenda and climate change agenda for, for that. For that. For that, uh, because I think one of the things that I faced the most when I was an uh, environment and climate change minister is that uh, the cabinet is actually not convinced of that we need to do something on environment, and this is something that is vote winning. They just, of course, they think that it's something good to do, they, they, but they don't think that it's something that you know the the youth. So I think if you look at the European, uh, the the how the West. Uh, the, youth is rising up in terms of uh, demanding for green agenda from, from the people in power and think then with that it will make the people who wants to be uh, do something, those who are in a position of power wants to do something much easier to convince their colleagues that this is something really to go ahead. And can you imagine that even the plastic import, it took me a long time to convince everyone that we should stop it, uh, you know. So, 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 I think it is um, it is time that you actually say, okay, I, we are all going to uh, uh, register to vote, and we only have one agenda: is that we demand each and every party who are going for an election a green agenda from you. What are you going to do with uh, waste management? What are you going to do with recycling efforts? What are you going to do with climate change? What are you going to do with this? Then you will make uh, all the people who wants your vote to do something about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you both panelists. Um, I think we have maybe one more or two more questions. Um, now, uh, if you go online on our viewers watching, um, we have a few, we have a lot of questions actually, but uh, YB actually has, has answered a lot of them. Um, another question for Julian, um, has the ocean been cleaner with, the turi with tourism at standstill for almost more than a year now? from Calvin? <laughs> I would love to be able to answer that question, Dish, and I really <laughs> would. Um, but we haven't been able to go out and do surveys because the government keeps locking us down. <clears throat> Leave that one alone. Uh, but we are hoping that when it, we, we can get out uh, for, for this year's survey programs in July or August, and maybe into September, and I can give you a de definitive answer then. But as I mentioned earlier on, essentially COVID started last March, right? So by the beginning of the tourism, when, when the tourism industry cut, starts off again next March, that's two years of, of almost zero tourism. Plus, it was monsoon for a few months before that, so it's almost two and a half years. Yeah. Uh, one would hope that there will be some improvement. Um, and if there is, then we're going to be speaking about that very loudly because it <laughs> demonstrates very clearly that leaving reefs alone is good for their health. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I wish I could tell you, but watch this space. I'll right. Tell you later in the year. All right, we have one final parting question to both of our uh, panelists. This is something that uh, we just want to know about you guys. Um, what is your favorite beach or dive site? Julian, go first. Uh, Tierman. I lived there for six years. It's a no-brainer. There's a place in my heart for, for Tierman Island. YB, are you a diver? YB, are you a diver? No, I'm not a diver. I can't <laughs> dive. I wanted to have a license in 2018. But then with more power, then I became a minister. So then I got pregnant after that. I got, so so yeah, I delayed one. Hour. So after I finished all my childbearing, I want, I want to get a diving license. Hopefully it's not too old then. Where, which is your favourite beach, YB? Oh, favorite I love beach. Langkawi. Langkawi. I, I, I love Langkawi, yeah. I, we, my husband and I always go there for a weekend before COVID <laughs> happened. Yeah. Everything, so, everything is before COVID. Yeah. yeah so, so, just to talk about, <laughs> so, just, just a final, final um, question about COVID because we, we talked about that a bit earlier. Like, how has what, what do you think would be uh, the way forward moving after COVID? Everything settled down, settles down, and 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 the government uh, borders are open, and 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 things kind of come back to normal. What would you? say would be a step forward to handling this um, plastics in the ocean issue. Julian? Um, there's strong indications from tourism experts that tourism is, is, is changing. There's not going to be mass a return to mass tourism. We need to start to develop niche ecotourism, community-based products. Um, talk to the specialists, they'll tell you. As part of that, it's, it's, it's real authentic experiences in pristine environments 
If we don't get that right, we will lose out once again to our international competitors. We have to get on top of things like waste management. We have to get on top of things like keeping the areas clean and in good condition. Otherwise, we're not going to get any tourists. So uh, I would like to see the government review tourism uh, products and services and markets from that perspective. They're important. They're a huge 20% of employment in this country in the hospitality and tourism industry. So it's very important that we get, when it comes back, that we get it right. All right. Why be your thoughts on this? Uh, my thoughts uh, on the overall on, on this is that I, I, I think one of the most important thing for us to do is islands. Uh, so if you look into tourism in, in island and all that, uh, especially in Sabah, I think a lot of, you have a lot of good potential islands but they are flush with uh, plastics waste because of the local, uh, the, the locals there do not have a plastic disposal system because they don't pay their chukai pinku Therefore, they, they are not collected by the council. Therefore, then they throw into the, the rubbish into the sea. Uh, one of the examples, uh, Lord Bahala, where my friend was an MP, they're actually doing a lot of local solutions. Um, one of our initiatives initially is that, can we do something in the island base? That means you don't send out your, your, your plastics or your, your rubbish to, to, the, to the mainland to be disposed, but you actually dispose in the in your own island and how you manage and how you reduce and use and recycle all your rubbish in that. So I think one of the things that we can help with tourism, especially on all these um, beautiful island sites, is to be able to say, okay, the government is going to subsidy, subsidize all the plastic uh, management and uh, no, waste management problem that you face. And then their islands will get very, very beautiful. I, 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 I think a, a, lot, a lot of Sabah islands are very beautiful. So we need to solve security problem, of course, but another thing is, uh, is the waste problem that, that we need to solve. And then a lot of islands as well. So, so if we can actually be able to say, okay, we open up and then uh, with all these islands, these are some of the very, very good opportunity, really good opportunity for Malaysian uh, tourism. All right. Thank you so much to the both panelists, YB Yobin, Member of Parliament for Bakri and Julian Hyde, General Manager of Reef Check Malaysia. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're sorry we couldn't answer all your questions. We had so many questions. Uh, we don't have enough time. But uh, my name is Dishan Kumar. Thank you for watching and goodbye. Take care, Bye. everyone. Thank you.